Hello everyone, this is Jen, and I make useful English lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices, and more to help you guys get top grades in the subject. So in today's video, we are analysing William Blake's poem, London. So let's start with a bit of context about the poet before we move on to looking at the language structure and form of the poem itself. William Blake was born in 1757 in London to humble beginnings. He was the son of a Hosea father and a yeoman mother. At the age of 25, he married a woman called Catherine Boucher, who was an illiterate but loyal woman who became Blake's lifelong assistant. Together they had no children, and at one point Blake even considered bringing a second wife into the family, which never really happened, because apparently Catherine was upset about the idea. On the whole, Blake led a modest, comfortable life as a professional engraver. Now, this is an important point because Blake was actually an artist by trade and poetry was more of a lifelong hobby for him, even though he did publish poems within small select circles of people. Now, this is why it can often be rewarding for us to read Blake's poems alongside their original engravings, because the art complements the verse and adds to the message. So although a deeply spiritual man, Blake hated all forms of institutional religion, like the church. Although he would often allude to God and biblical figures, in addition to classical and self-made myths as sources of creative inspiration. While he was ridiculed as a lunatic in his own time, he was posthumously vindicated as a visionary and prophetic seer. In terms of literary tradition, Blake belongs to the Romantic School, with other poets like Wordsworth, Keats, Coleridge, Shelley and Byron. But the eclecticism and deeply visionary nature of his work establishes him as one of a kind even within this group. So now that we know a bit about the context, let's dive straight into analysing the poem. Now, before we start reading the poem, I want to draw our attention to the poem's original layout and its mode of representation. So as we already know, Blake was an artist as well as a poet. And so all of his poetry was published with artwork as visual accompaniment. This is why, as mentioned, when reading Blake's poems, it's important that we experience his language in conjunction with his paintings, because the words themselves often can't suffice to convey the full extent of Blake's vision. So in the original publication of London, the poem's text is placed under a painting of a young child who seems to be guiding a hunched old man along the street while he's staring into the old man's weary looking face. And then next to stanzas two and three, we'll see another drawing of a man who's reaching into an outsized ball of flame. At least it seems like he's reaching into it, or maybe he's warming his hands against it. It's not very clear. But at this point, I'll simply point them out as important information for us to consider, but we will return to them at the end of our analysis when we will have developed a more sophisticated interpretation of the poem to be able to glean some meaningful insights from the artwork. So let's start with the first stanza. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. So we see the poem begins on an anecdotal note. And clearly we're being taken along a flaneur's journey as the speaker wanders through London and makes the series of observations about the city and its people. So perhaps the most prominent literary device that stands out here would be repetition with the words chartered in each chartered street where the chartered Thames does flow. So this establishes an impression of London as a city bound by spatial constraints because the word chartered means something that is legislatively defined. So this notion of constraint, however, poses a contrast to the final word in line two, which is flow. Right? Because chartered connotes some sort of constraint on movement, whereas flow, of course, means unhindered movement. And so in this contrast, we see one of the central tensions of the poem coming to the fore, which is that between confinement and freedom. And this is going to be a tension that threads throughout the poem as we carry on reading. So when we move on to lines three to four, repetition once again shows up in the anti-maria of mark 
in Mark and Every Face I Meet, Marks of Weakness, Marks of Woe. Now, antimeria refers to the use of the same word, but in different parts of speech. So the first mark in line three is used as a verb, meaning to notice something, but the marks in line four serve as nouns, meaning visible signs of something. But the near identical nature of mark as a verb and marks as nouns creates a lexical mirroring and suggests that perhaps the speaker sees himself, his own visage, reflected back at him in the passersby's frail and melancholic faces. So the speaker, as we see, is at once observer and participant in this gloomy urban landscape. Now with the turn into stanza two, there is the anaphora of in every from lines five to seven. As we see here, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of tear, in every voice, in every ban. So the speaker is underscoring in this hyperbolic flourish, the all encompassing grief and discontent of the masses that he sees in London. But the source of this deep discontent is delayed to the final line um, of the stanza as being what he calls the mind forged manacles. Now manacles refer to shackles and together with the earlier references to urban constraints, chartered street, chartered terms, etc., the idea of limited freedom and this imprisoning sense of confinement once again emerges. Now notice that there's an added sense of suffocation and inertia with the M nasal alliteration of mind forged manacles, as you notice here. As if these sounds contain some form of pent up, muffled energy that's waiting to erupt. And we will return to this point about alliteration in our analysis of the final stanza. But for now, the sonic imagery in the mind forged manacles I hear also implies that the people's suffering is so great that the speaker could almost hear in his head this imaginary scenario of people being chained up like a group of prisoners, despite this, of course, not being a visual reality. So externally, the Londoners are going about their days as normal, but underneath, mentally, they suffer deeply for living under some form of oppressive rule. By the way, guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. But what is the source of this oppressiveness? So the answer arrives in stanza three, when the speaker alludes to every blackening church. Let me use perhaps darker colour here. Every blackening church appalls. And when he alludes to those palace walls, okay, so as the stanza goes, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls. And the hapless soldier sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So if we remember from our context, Blake famously abhorred all forms of institutional control and religion. This is quite clearly reflected in line 10 with the reference to the blackening church. The blackening of every church could symbolize both the evil of church authorities and the ruinous influence of their activities on the common people. And it's also ironic that the chimney sweepers are those who happen to cry out this observation of blackening churches, because of course, a literal source of black dirt would be the chimney smoke. But the implication here is that no amount of sweeping can clean institutional religion of their blackness and evil. But the church isn't the only source of oppression, making lives hellish for Londoners. The king, and by extension the state, happens to be the other one. Because in the description of hapless soldiers sigh runs in blood down palace walls, we see the synesthesia of sigh, which is an auditory description, transmogrifying into blood, which is a visual description. And this reflects the emotional exasperation and physical sacrifice of those on the front lines in battle. And perhaps this is a historical allusion to British casualties 
in the French Revolutionary Wars, which were raging during the time when Blake was writing this poem around 1794. The French Revolutionary Wars began two years ago in 1792. Now, there's an interesting juxtaposition between the rawness of the soldiers' blood vis-a-vis -vis the sterility of these palace walls, because it shows that while common people are tasked to die in the name of protecting king and country, the king can always hide behind the sturdy shield of his palace walls, which is here used as a metonym to stand in for the powers that be who would willingly sacrifice the masses to guard their own selfish interests. Notice as well that unlike all the other stanzas, stanza three is composed entirely of trochaic units, specifically trochaic tetrameter with a dot line and a masculine ending. So as you'll see, it goes, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church of pause and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. So you see, these are all trochaic units of stress, unstress, da-da, da-da, da-da. This is all trochies. But if we very quickly go back to, for example, the previous stanza, we'll see it goes in every cry of every man in every infant's cry of tears. So you see, in this stanza, these are all iams, right? Which is the opposite of trochee, um, being an unstressed, stressed unit. So the frontal stress in this third stanza ramps up the emotional intensity of the moment and amplifies the speaker's outrage as he points out the rampant social injustices he witnesses around him. So this sudden wave of trochaic rhythm also functions to signal the poem's climax and central theme, which is to expose the power discrepancy between the rulers and the ruled king and the people, the royals and the commoners. However, it isn't until we reach the final stanza that we see what most troubles the speaker. In contrast to the imaginary mind-forged manacles he hears in stanza two, what he hears in the final stanza as he wanders through midnight streets is something real, raw, and very much piercing. As he says, How the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Actually, you also see the emotional intensity here being ramped up to another climax with the enjambment, uh, the absolute lack of pauses at the end of each line. What's important here is also the focal narrowing. Uh, as we go from this macro national level of the every face and every man in stances one and two, to now the more specific and individual references to these youthful harlots, um, the newborn infants, and the marriage hearse. So these are all very specific references. Now there's an unsettling juxtaposition of child prostitutes, which is youthful harlots, and the newborn babies. Uh, and this juxtaposition is especially poignant because it highlights the ease with which innocence can be tainted by moral decay and socioeconomic destitution. The notion of decay is also emphasized by the plosive sounds in blights and plagues, blasts the newborn infant's tear, as if comparing prostitution to a disease and the widespread availability of prostitution as the social epidemic. Now, if we recall, the first half of the poem features a lot of nasal sounds like marks of weakness, marks of woe, mind forged manacles, etc. But towards the final two lines, we see that this alliterative trajectory shifts by giving way to these more forceful plosives, the B's and the P's. And this dramatizes the eruption that we mentioned of that pent up volcanic angst felt 
both by the masses and the speaker. Now, the other juxtaposition that's interesting and worth noting here is that between marriage and hearse. So this is quite intriguing because marriage is conventionally seen as a celebratory event, a happy event, uh, one that's emblematic of union and the beginning of new lives. But hearse is the car that transports the coffin at funerals and as such is emblematic of separation and death. So is the speaker implying that marriage is perhaps not unlike the church or the state, because it's also a form of control and oppression, and one that's bound to subject the individual to lifelong misery. Now, it seems quite weird because Blake himself was apparently happily married, even though we know that at one point he tried to marry a second wife, but to no avail. But to make sense of this paradox then, of this marriage hearse, perhaps noting also that actually Blake, despite having been happily married, was also a believer in quote-unquote free love. But the bigger point here is that even though Blake was apparently content within his own marriage, he held a strong conviction in individual freedom as a whole. And his deep belief in individual freedom jarred against the social and religious construct of marriage as this one man, one woman institution to which people must somehow be bound, be obliged to comply with. So we see from the poem's beginning to its end, control is seen to take on various forms from the state to the individual level, and all of which is seen to result in human suffering, whether physical, as in the soldier's blood, or psychological, as in the infant's tear, and the unhappy marriage alluded to in the final reference to the marriage hearse. Now, this motif of control is also manifested in the rigidity of the poem's form, which comprises four quatrains, and an alternate rhyme scheme, as we see here, these four quatrains, four line stances, very regular. And the alternate rhyme scheme that pretty much doesn't really divert at all with street, meet, flow, woe, man, ban, fear, hear, cry, sigh, appalls, walls, hear, tear, curse, hearse. It's very neat. So except for the trochaic shifts in actually line four, Four marks of weakness, marks of woe, the entire stanza three, which we had just pointed out, as was well lines 14 and 15. How the youthful harlot's curse blasts the uh, newborn infant's tear. There's very little structural divergence on the whole. And so perhaps this what this does is it mirrors the caged, confined, and shackled existence of the Londoners from the speaker's eyes. So as a final point, let's return to Blake's artwork for this poem, as promised at the start of our analysis. At this point, I think it's worth thinking about what the child and the weary old man could symbolize. And of course, also, what about the man who is either warming his hands against the ball flame or here ambiguously also implied to be reaching his hands into the ball of flame? So if we pay attention to the tonal progression of the poem, we'll notice that the tone starts off with this hint of wonder in stanzas one and two, right? Uh, as, as we see this eye marking in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So there's a sense of um, almost kind of discovering London for the first time. Oh, I see in every face um, this sort of grief, right? Uh, there's a sense of discovery here. But it actually changes into this sense of outrage and shock as we reach the latter half of the poem in stanzas three and four, as if the speaker, as he ventures into the city for discovery, he instead uncovers dark realities for the very first time. So there's a sense then that the speaker sees London as if from a child's vantage. And while London itself, the city itself, is so wrought with marks and scars of pain and grief, is perhaps symbolized by this close-lidded, weary old man. And so meanwhile, the outsized flame here perhaps conjures up the perhaps conjures up hellish associations, which is obviously apt given the poem's sin-ridden apocalyptic portrayal of the city. But the presenter man reaching somehow into this flame also suggests that ultimately humans are the ones who create their own hellish existence, both for others and for themselves. And so while those in power obviously subject others to the hell of suffering, like the king, subjecting his soldiers to bloodshed and sacrifice. Those without power, like the commoners, 
would also internalize these hellish conditions in which they are placed, and hence the mind-forged manacles alluded to in line eight, which serves throughout the poem as a governing image. And that is it for this analysis of William Blake's London, guys. I hope you enjoyed this, found it useful. And if you did, please hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you haven't already so that you don't miss any of my useful English Lit Study videos going forward. You can also, of course, check out my Pan Conflict playlist in the description box below for those of you who are doing the GCSE Pan Conflict Poetry Anthology. And finally, don't forget to follow me on Instagram at hyperbolit. You can always DM me with any questions that you may have, and I will see you guys very soon in the next video.